Okay, so uh, maybe you are always wondered how you could do Jedi mind tricks with a computer, and uh, that's exactly why we are here now. So uh, Gnudi is uh, going to tell you uh, fundamentals of EEG-based brain computer interface, and uh, he's always been fascinated with the human brain, and uh, he is a researcher in that scope, and I give the stage to you, Gnudi. Hello. Um, the reason why I'm giving this talk is um, recently there has been a development in electroencephalography. That was developed uh, about 100 years ago um, and has been used in research and in medicine as well. Um, but we now have um, consumer grade EEG headsets as well as some open hardware projects um, aiming to develop um, EEG headsets. Um, there I have um, a picture of the Emotive Epoch, which I think was the first consumer grade EEG headset. And um, actually I think the aim of the OpenBCI project is to um, get um, cheap research grade hardware. Um, I'm not going to explain too much about, um, about the devices. Um, I want to talk a bit about um, how we can use EEG readings to, um, to have a brain-computer interface. Um, a brain-computer interface um, typically consists of a user having a task. The task can be um, um, thinking, for example, to, ha to have some input to, um, if um, if it's used to, to drive an electric wheelchair, for example, it, it could be a thought to go forward. Um, the signal has to be, um, the EEG signal has to be acquired. Um, I'm, I'm not going to talk about uh, that. I'm more focusing on the pre-processing of the data and the feature extraction. Classification can generally be done with all kinds of classifiers. Um, popular are support vector machines. Um, but a good feature extraction is essential. Um, we cannot really do um, um, machine learning approaches where we learn the features because we typically ha do not have very much training data. Um, doing EEG experiments with human subjects takes a lot of time and also um, the data might contain uh, um, private information, um, so often the data sets are not uh, made public. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'm going to talk about mainly. But generally, after classification, we have an output translation. It can be a virtual keyboard or something. Um, and there can be, that is optional, a feedback um, that allows the user to train the brain computer interface. Um, here I'm showing you the timeline of an EEG signal. This was a resting state experiment, um, so the subject was just resting, doing nothing with eyes open. Um, you can't see very much in the timeline. It um, looks quite random, random oscillations, quite low. Generally, the signals are in the uh, millivolt um, range. Um, so one of the first steps that you can do, um, do a time frequency analysis. Um, so what we have here is we have 14 seconds of EEG and 14 electrodes, that's the 14 channels that the um, Emotive Epoch EEG headset has. Um, and here we also have 14 seconds and uh, this is basically doing a um, um, couple of um, yeah, um, computing uh, s s spectra for different time slots. So you see the development of the spectrum over time. And what you see here is one of the things that make it uh, difficult. Most of the signal power um, is in the range bef um, below f um, 5 hertz. Um, the different frequency ranges are typically associated with, um, um, for example, yeah, some states of mind, like sleep states. 
um, actually it's quite easy, even with a timeline, to, um, to see in which sleep state someone is. Um, um, important is, um, is the alpha band. Um, that's something that should be in, uh, in the plot that I showed before as well. Um, we couldn't really see that in the timeline. If actually I had instructed the subject to have the eyes closed but not open, um, we would have seen um, oscillations in that range on the um, electrodes that are um, above the visual cortex because um, they would go to idle state as, uh, if nothing is seen and um, we would have more power in there. Um, if we are doing EG experiments, um, we typically look into changes because we have this huge um, random noise signal um, where we have basically no idea what it means. Um, we typically have experiments where we look at some, um, um, at, at least two different states. Um, so we define something as a baseline and then we typically look at what changes if we, for example, we have a resting state task for the subject and then the task is to think um, maybe the, ta um, um, the command to move the wheelchair. Um, what we see here is again from the same EG, EG recording. Um, what I did was I used the two seconds before that are not plotted here, but it looks about the same. Uh, computed the average and um, um, divided it all by it. Um, we call that a baseline correction. So now um, it's easier to see changes here in, in the other areas. So um, having a baseline is something that you um, normally do if you have some EG experiments. Um, we also have some other problems besides the general back no uh, background noise that we have. Um, it's artifacts. Here it's a similar um, timeline. The difference is um, the subject was instructed to blink in intervals. You see that there are some huge peaks there, especially on the lower and the higher lines. That's because um, according to the tw uh, 1020 system, um, the electrodes are numbered around the head. So on the top and on the bottom, it's basically um, the electrodes on the forehead. So what we see there is eye artifacts. Um, actually, to see artifacts, um, that's quite easy in the EEG timeline. The problem is getting rid of it um, if we don't want to have it. So we start typically by instructing subjects um, not to blink, not to move. Um, also a problem uh, can be um, having, um, for example, the 50 hertz uh, power grid um, um, can also be an artifact in the signal. Therefore, we typically have um, um, uh, filters at, um, at that frequency. Um, there are different approaches to to get rid of the artifacts, the simplest one is cutting out of the data um, the parts with artifacts. But this basically means we have to um, repeat the experiment to have it several times. Um, but we are doing that anyway. Um, if we... Um, um, one approach for brain-computer interfaces are event-related potentials. Um, if we have an event that could be a subject is shown um, a picture or any other stimuli, um, uh, and we repeat that, um, and then we um, average over all the repetitions of showing this image, um, then all the random noise will uh, will cancel out, and what we are left with is um, the EEG component that actually depends on the processing of um, showing this image. Um, and that we call an event-related potential. 
Um, this is just an example. Uh, typically, it doesn't look that nice. Um, um, we typically count the peaks. So we have three um, positive peaks here. We call P1, P2, P3. And the P3 are also called P300 because it's about 300 milliseconds after the stimulus. That is something that we use for brain-computer interfaces. Um, because um, there's the so-called oddball paradigm. The P300 is only there if something is relevant to your task and it's uh, not happening very often. So the P300 speller, which is um, something like a virtual keyboard, unfortunately I don't have an animation, um, the lines and rows um, would light up at, uh, uh, at some speed. If you want to type a letter, you would focus on a letter and when it lights up, uh, that is a rare and relevant uh, event to you um, because you want to type it. So exactly in that case, you will have um, the P300 in your ERP. And uh, of course, um, the system that is providing the stimuli um, is recording the timing and then knows which, um, which letter actually lit, um, was lit up when uh, this appeared. So this way you can type things, um, but again, you would need to, to stare at one letter for a while because it has to be repeated um, several times. So uh, I want to present a more specialized P300 based um, brain computer interface that uh, is an authentication scheme. The idea is we are having 100 normal photos, can be anything, and we select some which um, are our password. Um, so this is the example that is actually a set that we use for the experiments. Um, um, five very different photos. So now I'm doing a small experiment with you. Um, try to um, um, remember those photos and um, try to see them and count them in um, this video stream. So um, I think I'm not asking you to raise your arms because I can't see you anyway. I guess some of you um, will, might have seen all five pictures, might, some might have counted less. Um, for the first time, the task is not really easy, but generally um, when in this experiment you, you counted something, you will probably have had this P300 in your brain. Um, um, those are the results of the experiment. Um, I hope you can read it. Might be a bit too dark. Um, as we have 95 non-target image and only 5%, so five uh, target images, um, we use the uh, F1 score um, um, to evaluate the classifier. Um, we did cross-validation on the data here where we have the best score. We also did um, train the classifier, which was a simple a, um, linear discriminant analysis. Um, um, we trained it just by the experiment done by one person. And then we also tried to do a, a general classifier that we trained uh, with other people's data. For that, we used the best data set that we have that had the highest um, score in the cross-validation. Um, it still works. Um, the interesting thing here is that um, the classification of the EEG data is possible without tuning the classifier to the um, user, um, making the system non-biometric. Um, this is um, the number of trials that we averaged. So we actually showed um, 50 of those bursts that you have seen just before. 
um, that takes about 20 minutes and no one wants to use an authentication system where one login takes 20 minutes. So we looked at how many bursts do we actually need, but it seems like uh, up to 50 it still increases. And there is a huge difference between different sets. So um, the highest line is the, is the top rated subjects and the others are much lower. So it, depends a lot on the subject, maybe also on how well the um, EEG headset fit and of maybe how well they focused on the task. Um, yeah, but it's um, the biggest effect that we found was um, um, for an authentication system, we want to have uh, permanence. So if we want to log in again after a few months, it should still work. So we had three um, sessions with some months in between. Uh, and actually, we got better scores over time. Uh, we feared that they might degrade, but it seems there's a training effect. Um, yeah, and the signal is permanent enough. So here is the final score, that's a plot, because even though it's no real biometric system, um, we are measuring biosignals, um, and that can go wrong. Uh, therefore, we have false acceptance rates and um, false rejection rates, and we are coming to an equal error rate of about 10%, which is, of course, too bad, especially when you see that one authentication round takes about 20 minutes. Um, yeah, so the idea was if we, have the, uh, if we are showing the images very fast, we can have a very short um, uh, login time, but it actually didn't really work well enough. And uh, that's it. Um, there are three minutes left. Are there questions? Ah, I found my voice again. So, indeed, we have uh, a bit of time. There are two microphones and the internet. So remember, and there's a question at that microphone. Hello there. Um, I was wondering, have, have you heard of uh, uh, this being used to detect terrorists? Um, there, was a, there was an experiment done where they showed images of things that you're not supposed to know as a, as a regular citizen. So they would show all these innocent images and then there would also be uh, a blasting cap or the magazine of an AK-47 or stuff that you're supposed to know if you went to a terrorist training camp. And they would do the exact same P-300 thing. I thought that was interesting. And of course, if you read about, you know, about training camps and terrorists, uh, you would fail the tests, which would be interesting. Yeah. Um I haven't heard about the application on terrorism, but very similar, the application on uh, criminal um, investigations as a lie detector based on P300. So basically the same, uh, you are showing some pictures that only the... Um, uh, only the um, guilty knowledge tests. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, uh, that only the one who is guilty uh, knows and... Um, but there are also some papers about uh, if you are uh, if you are attack attacked by this P300 based uh, guilty knowledge test, how to um, how to prevent being detected. Okay, another question. That microphone. I have two small questions. One is, which was the EG headset used in the image based authentication? Was it the Open BCI? And then also, is P300 um, like individualized, like does it need a lot of calibration or is it something that you can just detect like straight in? Um, so um, the EEG headset used for, for the experiments was the Emotive Epoch. Um, and um, the P300 seems to be a bit individual. Um, there are approaches doing biometrics um, by looking at the P300, uh, but our approach was to have a general P300 detector that would uh, work on anyone. That was the difference between the IC, the individual classifier, and the uh, GC, general classifier. Um, you can see the score difference here, the middle and the right one. And the left one was the cross-validation. Okay, is there a question from the internet? I'm looking at the... No question from the internet. Um, 
So unfortunately, the time is running out, and so I have to ask you to approach Knödi directly. And um, I don't know, you're here, you're at the Congress, and yep. can be contacted in some yep. way, I guess. Okay, then I would say thanks, Knödi, again for his talk. <laughs>